uses of the word deceiving your own self. The most dangerous place to be in Chicago is in a church where you hear the word and you do nothing. That's right. It's almost better not even to go to church. It's almost better not to go to church. Because if I'm not doing the word, that same passage in James says, I'm like a man who looks in a mirror. And when I walk away, I forget what I look like. Now I'm a prophet, I'm not a pastor. My total desire is to teach enough that you have your own visitation. Somebody say my own visitation. My own visitation. Say my own visitation. My own and when you go to a church that puts that on the back burner and says that's not necessary, everything in your life gets messed up. God does not want you to be good. Now let me explain that. God put every single one of us in a garden. Say, my heart, my heart is his garden. My heart is his garden. And so we have a picture of this in the book of Genesis. And in that tree that God says don't eat from was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Now this is a passion of mine because if you don't understand what I'm about to say, you will just waste your time in church. You'll waste your time because you won't grow. Somebody say grow in the spirit. Grow in the spirit. So there are two trees in the garden. The first tree was the tree of life or the tree of direct relationship. The forbidden tree was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The intellectual knowledge of good and evil. So no matter what part of that tree I ate from, if I ate from the evil side, I would die. If I ate from the good side, I would die. Why? You don't have a perspective to know what is good and what is evil for the next 100 years. Your actions right now are a domino effect. Some of you here, your grandfather or your great grandfather made a decision to immigrate to America and you're here. His decision became your domino effect. And so God is a God of generations. He's not just watching your life. He's seeing your children's children, 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 children. And so when you understand that we're not just having church, but that we are affecting eternity by our decisions, everything changes. And so we have these two trees in a garden, which is a personification of the two trees in your heart. The tree of the spirit of relationship with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit or the tree of intellect. The tree of intellect. Can anybody tell me where Jesus was crucified? What was the name of the place? Golgotha. Does anybody know what Golgotha means? The place of the skull. What's inside of your skull? Your intellect. Your intellect. And we know from the scriptures that thorns symbolize the curse. Where did God put the crown of thorns? On the head. It couldn't be more clear. Jesus was crucified in a place called the skull with the curse on the intellect. Your intellect makes a wonderful servant, but a horrible master. Just like money. Money makes a wonderful servant, but a horrible master. And so we got people that get born again in the spirit and they begin to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because they never process it through the spirit. They think the more knowledge I have about the Bible, the more spiritual I am. How many have heard the phrase, you are what you eat? That's not true. Anybody ever had the flu? You are what you digest. You've got to digest this stuff. It has to become life. Just because you hear a bunch of sermons doesn't mean it turns into life for you. 
has to be digested. You got to meditate on it. You got to understand it. So today I'm going to begin to talk about God's plan for man. Not just man, but mankind. Everybody say plot. Plot. Subplot. Subplot. Plot. Plot. Subplot. Subplot. If you ever go to see a good movie, there's always two things happening in the movie. There's a plot and then there's a subplot. There's the main story, then there's the supporting story. How many ever seen the movie Shrek? The cartoon Shrek. The plot is a distempered ogre meets a human that's really an ogre. That's the plot. And they have all these other characters that are subplot. How many knows what the plot of the Bible is? How many can tell me the plot of the Bible? I'm going to lead you to a discovery. What's God's favorite name in the Bible? What's God's favorite name in the Bible? Father. Father. Why? Father wants a family. What's the plot? It's an open book test, guys. I'm giving you the answer right now. <laughs> See, this is how Jesus taught. He led them to make their own discovery. What's the plot of the Bible? Father wants a family. One, two, three. Father wants a family. One, two, three. Father wants a family. One, two, three. Father wants a family. And so when you read the book of Genesis, the first two chapters are God's plot. Adam and Eve in a garden, being with her father, relationship. Then she eats the fruit and her nature is corrupted. And when her nature is corrupted, she starts living out of her intellect, not out of the spirit. And so after the first two chapters of Genesis, all the rest of the Bible is restoration. The law of first mention in the Bible is that whenever something happens, the first time in the scriptures is significant. God calls that significant. It's a law of first mention. Where did Jesus do his first miracle at? A wedding. Ah, a wedding. Why? He was telling us the plot. What's the plot? Father wants a family. I want to get this beat in your head that tonight at four o'clock in the morning you hear my voice. What is the plot? Father wants a family. What's the plot? Father wants a family. What's the plot? Father wants a family. So I'm going to name some things, and you either say plot or subplot. Casting out demons, plot or subplot? Subplot. Prophecy, plot or subplot? Subplot. Teaching, plot or subplot? Subplot. Marriage? Plot. Sons and daughters? Plot. Family. Plot. Relationship. Plot. Wow, we got a <laughs> and so the problem is that we got churches, they get born again and they go right to the subplot. They major in the subplot. Had a pastor I was talking to a couple of weeks ago. He's been a pastor 20 some years. I said, how often do you preach on marriage and family? And he goes, wow, I don't think ever. What are you preaching? Dominion, power, miracles, healing, prosperity. I said, well, you have a subplot church. You're living in the subplot. What did God sow into the earth? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's plot. Because you can't have a family without sons and daughters. Today there's going to be a shaking in your soul. Why? God wants to shift you from living for subplot to living in the plot. I want you to fast forward to the day of your death. Let's say that you're dying at 87 years old. 
You've lived a long life. You're dying a natural death. People are knowing you're going to die for about the last 90 days. What do you want to happen the last 90 days of your life on earth? You want to see your car one more time? You want to see your jewelry one more time? What do you want to see? I want to see family. I want to be surrounded by family. And it's amazing people, especially men, live for everything else most of their life and they find they've lost They majored in the minors. They were living in the subplot. And it's not that it's bad stuff. We need deliverance. We need worship. We need singing. We need social issues to be dealt with. But if we don't have the plot, we lose what God is after. How many know the story about when God told Israel to build him a tabernacle? And there were seven pieces of furniture, brazen altar, the laver, the candelabra, all that stuff. But when he put that all together, everything was in sequence. Then what happened? A cloud came. Say the cloud comes on the house. See, you can have a little cloud on your little piece of furniture. But if you don't understand, I'm here to build the house. Come on, somebody shout, I was born to build a house. I was born to build a house. Say it again. I was born to build a house. Close your eyes and say it again. I was born to build a house. And when you ask people, hey, where do you go to church at? Oh, I go over there. Are you faithful? Oh, yeah. What do you like about that church? Oh, I like the teaching. I like the worship like the men's ministry. I like the coffee and donuts at the beginning of the service. Oh, there's guys, that's why they go there, hang out. But then they have an empty soul because you were born to build the house of God. The angriest Jesus ever got was that he saw people misusing the house. He made a whip, nostrils flaring, veins popping, voice just so angry. You have made my father's house a den of thieves. Why? What God gets most mad at is an indicator of what's most important. What God gets most angry at is an indicator of what's most important. How many understand that marriage is not as exciting as dating? (laughs) Dating is around external events. You get all looking good, clean your car, especially on a first or second date. You go, oh, Lord Jesus, I'm Holy Ghost tenderoni up in here. This is the one, Lord, is this the one? And you're on your best behavior. How many understand that dating is a job interview? (laughs) Dating is a job interview. You don't see the real person. You see the behavior modification job interview woman or man. It's a job interview. You don't see them under pressure. If she's having a period, she says, you know what, I'll, I'll catch you in a couple days. You never see her on her period. That's a law of a woman. Don't date on your period. Oh, no, I, you, I don't want you to see me when I'm having my monthly cycle because I'm Why am I saying this? Event Christianity, celebrity Christianity is much more exciting than just coming to church and having regular growing services. Taking 17 pages of notes. 
seeing your friends, fire didn't fall from heaven. The singer didn't hit the highest note in the building. You see, we value church by events, not by the plot. Wow. That's good. Come on. That's why marriage is not as exciting as dating. When you get married, it's for generational purposes. How many understand that you don't keep your wife for the same reason you married your wife? Purposes change. I've been married going on three decades. I'm not staying with my wife for the same reason I married my wife. Our purposes have changed, our kids, our destiny. We've grown together for communion, relationship, shared memories. Somebody say shared memories. Shared memories. Say shared memories. Shared memories. You see, without shared memories, you can't have good relationships. You understand that when you're friends with somebody, you don't even speak in full sentences anymore. They say, man, you remember the time we was at the Cubs game and DJ, oh man. If somebody's hearing your conversation, it makes no sense because they've never shared the memories. And you were made by God to live on shared memories. You get a promotion, but you got nobody to share it with. You could tell a stranger, but hey, I got a $15,000 raise. Good for you. Man, I just had my fourth grandchild. Huh. But the people who shared your life. Really? And they know the names of your wife and your kids. They know the name of the places you went to. And we have built churches like dating centers, not like houses where we're married together. You know why it's so quiet in here? Because a lot of you have been living in the subplot. When you watch Christian television, it's all about subplot. It's mostly about subplot. And now the man of God, the miracle power. This will forever change your life. If you send the anointed cherub of God a thousand dollars, you will never be the same again. <laughs> Come on, Come on. Plot or subplot? What's God's favorite name? Father. Why? Father wants a family. What's God's favorite name? Father. Why? He wants a family. What's God's favorite name? Father. Why? Father wants a family. So here we have a bunch of men in this conference. You're not better than women, but you are different than women. You carry a different mantle, you carry a different anointing, you carry a different assignment. And God's going to take a little piece of his manhood, his father nature, and impart it into you and say, demonstrate me in the earth. Build me a family. Build me generational. This is a very strange statement. Got to pay attention so you'll catch it. A couple of Christmases ago, I had all my kids there. I think I had like 13 grandkids at the time. All my kids are going to church. All my grandkids are, you know, they, they're kids. They're not perfect. It was one of those times where everybody's kind of opening presents and they've had their second dessert. And I'm sitting on the couch and I'm separated from everybody. I'm watching everybody. And the Spirit of God falls on me. Now I'm looking at my little grandsons and granddaughters and my kids are harmonious. And the Lord said, son, I'm jealous of you. God told me he was jealous of me. I said, what does that mean? He says, your family has harmony today. 
my family has disharmony today worldwide. Nothing irritates a parent worse than when their kids are fighting, not talking, not communicating. It destroys the family. God's plan for world conflict